We have had always the benefit that if we stood our ground, we were difficult to overcome. It is finding the courage to stand our ground which is difficult. Because the parties who must be prepared to stand their ground are weakly hierarchically organized, are decentralized geographically, don't possess access immediately to counsel or the best possible information about their real situation, and when faced with an extremely threatening sounding letter from extremely wealthy looking people working on behalf of extremely annoying corporations, they have a tendency to believe that if they don't surrender, they will be shot. In the century of people power, you can say that this is not the case, but you cannot show the picture of the people climbing on the tanks. Soon we must have such pictures which is why we're here this morning, I suspect. In addition, then, to the inherent weaknesses of the patent as a jail for ideas and the disadvantages that aggressive parties have in pursuing people who cannot be pursued successfully for royalties, there are some other significant difficulties that patent holders have. The interdependency of the global economy and the growing heterogeneity of everybody's IT environment means that a patent holder really swinging a big ax is almost certainly going to hit people it cannot afford to offend. This has recurrently been the problem of the Microsoft monopoly in recent years. The desire for patent aggression is almost unbridled, but the ecological constraints against patent aggression are significant. Every year, for some years now, without exception, Mr. Balmer or those around him have spent some portion of their summer months on vacation mugging businesses. Quiet little lunches with CEOs one summer, followed by speeches in Singapore another summer, followed by some little episode in the press on another summer, but there was a recurrent third quarter activity that consisted of telling businesses that they should be frightened that free and open source software infringed Microsoft patents. Some years, Mr. Balmer was even prepared, it was said, to disclose to people which these patents were, provided that CEOs first entered into agreements not to discuss the very patent numbers with their own lawyers. You remember that even in Business Week, one could find reputable business executives complaining, though never with their names attached, about the treatment they had received at the hands of Microsoft in private, allegedly informal meetings. And every year, the very same consequences followed from the very same conduct. Important, responsible chief executive officers of businesses with real clout around the world called up Redmond and said, that's my business you're threatening, Mr. Balmer. And if you continue to threaten it, we will continue to act to solve our problem by protecting our interests against you. If you threaten to shut down our investment bank or our securities house, we'll do something that will make you wish you hadn't done that. We're not 12-year-olds. You can't succeed by suing your customers. This is a very, very serious ecological restraint on patent holder misbehavior. Very serious. Nobody should overlook the consequences which have followed as a, consequ as a result of unwillingness on the part of large businesses to be even secondarily harmed by the monopolist's attempt to pursue its free competitors. The consequences of that pushback have been to make the monopoly or any other party seeking similarly anti-competitive outcomes from the use of its patents to gain over its customers rather than to permit them to be threatened. Note now the narrowing of the gauge within which the patent holder swings his weapon. His develop, the developers with whom he is choosing to go to war are not directly reachable. They do not produce sufficient revenue, therefore they are not economically feasible to sue, and to the extent that you shut them down, you merely move production into other hands. The customers downstream from those patent, those patent allegedly patent infringing developers are also not suable for they are too much interdependent with the patent holding monopolist himself in the global economy. The patent holder risks 
significant ecological pushback. Now, in the long run, you can conceive of ways to begin to reduce both threats. In the first place, you can concentrate attention on those who lie in between the developers and the users. In short, you can concentrate your attention on the aggregating distributors. And the representatives of Red Hat and Novell and other such aggregating distributors are, of course, well aware of the pain that comes from being the party just large enough to have a royalty stream and just small enough not to have three or 4,000 patents in your back pocket with which to cross-license out of trouble. That industry structure, that there were distributors with a revenue stream large enough to attack but with patent defenses inadequate to their defense was itself a choice made by industry giants who will in the long run have to take responsibility for that decision. But for the moment, the nature of existing industry geometry at least affords targets to shoot at. And thus, we evolve need for enhanced community solidarity mechanisms to prevent those parties either from being successfully attacked or from being forced to make separate pieces disadvantageous to the interests of the community as a whole. That's the source of the newspapers you are now reading from day to day. You can also, as a monopolist, seek to push back against this situation by going into long-term alliance with powerful trolls. Ah, it is not we who are threatening the business of Bank of America, Deutsche Bank, and etc. It is some mysterious set of missile silos located in some underpopulated part of South Dakota under the control of nobody quite knows who in a venture not quite as intellectual as it is military under circumstances which are too obscure to know about and which of course do not report themselves to the Securities and Exchange Commission because they are not publicly traded entities getting their money in the securities markets. They are instead, let us suppose, just at random, uh, very wealthy pr prior executives of the monopoly engaged in investing in patent trollism as a business model whose uncoordinated activity might in the long run undermine to some extent the natural ecological protections against monopoly misbehavior in a real functioning market. And we have worried about this threat no small amount over the years. We have taken measures to understand the nature of such threats. We have built intelligence networks designed to keep us informed of the capabilities and intentions of such parties. But there is no overall unique answer to the best possible way to defend oneself against such parties. At certain stages in the advanced development of empires, unmanned warfare becomes an important technique. The soldiers of the empire are too valuable to be wasted or too controversial to be used, and so one resorts to drones. This is, it is true, happening in the patent wars at present. But drones are hard to steer. They have their own guidance problems. They have their own command and control problems. They are idiosyncratic players, and it is difficult to mobilize them effectively if your real goal is to get people to pay you royalties in the end. Because the other underlying weakness of the monopoly position is it requires the royalties. It can no longer simply survive on the basis of the use of patents for blockages. Had Microsoft been willing to engage in broad-scale patent aggression while it was still economically untroubled in the pursuit of its core businesses, we would have been worse off. But we have already won a sufficient strategic victory to improve our overall position because we forced them to wait to begin significant patent aggression until their own business model had begun to fail. The consequence is that they can no longer afford not merely that they are unwilling, they can no longer afford to forego the, the attempt to get paid for our software. And this is a prevailing strategic weakness. In conducting our side of the war against them, one of the greatest advantages that we have is that they cannot simply gratuitously promise safety in return for treason. They must be paid. 
and as a consequence of the need to return a revenue stream to their books, they are less capable of drone warfare than would be optimal for their commanders in the field. We will make more than merely tactical use of that point as we go along. So there are, from the technical point of view, for a lawyer engaged in actually figuring out a grand strategy across multiple theaters, there are significant advantages, not at first sight visible, in what is, in general, a bad terrain organized in a foolish way through the weakness of government and the strength of the adversary. But we possess some significant resource. Now we must use that available resource wisely. <laughs> we cannot squander it. And we have to understand what the primary basis of the forthcoming conflict is. Here I should say, uh, though I'm sure it's apparent already in the remarks I've made, that we're already at war. This is not the last generation of peace. This is not the period immediately before the lull. This is not the edgy part of 1939. We are at war already. The Fortune article in the United States earlier this summer, in which our colleagues in Redmond said how many can grenades of nuclear power they have in the bag, is the beginning of the actual period of hostilities, overt and straightforward. We were, in fact, at war for 12 months before that, eight months of it in a hot sort of way, post the deal between Microsoft and Novell. But we are now fundamentally engaged in several theaters. And that's going to continue, in my judgment, until what it would be right to call the end. I do not think that this is a reversible undertaking. If Microsoft wanted to get out of the patent war now, they probably still could. But only a few months are left before all parties have mobilized, things have started to happen, and the process of unrolling will become unmanageable for them. They're committed. Personally, I think they are committed too soon and in the wrong places. As a field commander, as a party overseeing some theaters of engagement, my belief is that they have moved too soon and that they are going to regret that deeply in the end because they were unready for the war they have started. But whatever may be the case on that subject, we should understand that from here on out, what we do, we do under the pressure of actual combat. We will pay for our mistakes, and we will not get back any forces that we use wrongly. Therefore, we do have to make some judgments about the questions of what is absolutely necessary in the end as against what will allow us to carry on the war for the moment. And here we'd better go back to how the rest of the map looks. For contrary to Fortune's way of thinking about the situation, it is not merely Microsoft against the free world. If it were, they would have a better chance. The fundamental characteristic of the last 10 years is that the IT industry globally around the world has begun to lose its enthusiasm for the patent system. I don't mean that everybody has decided to stop patenting, nor do I mean that everybody has decided to stop defending their patents. But everybody has come to more or less the same conclusion, which is that living amidst a proliferation of nuclear hand grenades doesn't make you safer. <laughs> 